grew up in a small town in a rural village in Indonesia, 10,000 miles away from here. My father is a small factory worker, and he is also a local imam at a local mosque. My mom works at home, and I have two brothers, an older one and a younger one. As a family, we would go to attend Friday prayers, fast during Ramadan, and I also listen to my brothers as they deliver the call to prayer. We're a simple family living under $200 a month or less. My father always brought me home newspaper for me to read because it was cheap enough and it was also one of his only ways of introducing me to the world. One day, about 15 years ago, I was eight, I read the headline news. It was a picture of the Twin Towers engulfed in fire. I had never seen an explosion in my life, so that picture just haunted me. After that day, every time my dad would come home from work, I would just rush into him and then open the global affairs section just to know what happened next. I followed the news patiently, patiently, until the day the President of the United States at that time announced the war on terrorism. I had no idea what that meant. So on the following days, I saw a footage of a tank coming into the Middle East, and there were some children running around it. I suddenly thought of running away from explosions and trying to save my siblings and not being able to go to school, and I asked my mom, Mom, when a war happens, do children, what do they do? Do they go to school? That day in third grade, that day I saw the footage, I just couldn't focus at school. And my teacher asked me what was wrong, and I told her, well, there was war in the Middle East, and to calm me down, she took us to a room to pray for the children. My prayer was just simple then. It was just for my fellow eight years old to be safe wherever they were and to be able to go to school. But that day, my life has changed. I gradually grew to be more and more interested in global affairs, international relations. I would look up books in the library, borrow newspapers, talk to my friends. I joined the debate team. Then in high school, I was selected to participate in a peace mission program as a peace ambassador. This program enabled me to go to an American high school and also to live with an American family. When my neighbors in the village heard about this, they were kind of confused. You see, I am the only daughter of my family, and in fact, I'm the only granddaughter in the extended family, so they didn't understand my parents' decision to let me go to a foreign land so far away. Their understanding of the US is that it's a country full of corruption, capitalism, and disbelievers. And so they told my parents, you'll end up like that. I finally received my dad's answer during the farewell event of this program. Our parents was, were asked to put a flag as a symbol of our departure. I saw my father's eyes as he put on this flag on me, and he looked at my eyes and he said, don't be afraid. The prophet, peace be upon him, encouraged us to travel and to be rahmat alil alamin, which means to show love and mercy on earth. You, my daughter, at the end of the day, is just like another human being. You have that responsibility too. You have to show love to others, just like how you love your family. And I knew, he, he, I knew that he saw my afraid eyes and that my neighbors were afraid then too. I also knew that, that what he said to me planted this realization within my heart that I have that responsibility too, to love others and to do that the first step for me was to open myself up. My journey in the United States wasn't smooth. Speaking English 24 seven, trying to figure out the locker system in the back of the school, praying in the library, trying to be quiet, but everyone looking at you kind of weird. Why are you worshiping? Is it full moon tonight? <laughs> and it got even harder actually because my first US family fell ill and I had to urgently move from that house. However, all the families that signed up for this program were at full capacity. So I had to depend on friends' homes, teachers' homes, coordinators' homes, and at some point it felt like I was homeless. 
And I waited and I waited and I didn't have a host family and I thought to myself, do you want to quit? And I told myself, no, I wanted to keep going. However, who would open their home for me? A Muslim girl from a foreign country. It was Joseph Malachek. Joseph is a friend that I met during lunch period. He's just like another Ohio high school kid wearing Ohio State University t-shirt, carrying his skateboard around at school. It was just a lunch period and he asked me, hey, how are you doing? What are you going through? And I told him, I don't have a host family to continue my program. To my surprise, he actually told his parents and his parents offered to host me and that same week I moved in with them and suddenly a new page of my journey began. The Malachak made me feel like I had always been part of them. Knowing I'm a Muslim and I don't eat pork, they actually did not cook pork the whole time I was with them because it's the rules of the Malachak family not to eat something that one family member could not eat. But I mean, imagine they practically gave up bacon. Would you do that? Um, I remember taking Katie from school as she was in the elementary school at that time and she screamed uh, at me, showing off me to her friends. She's my sister! And then her friends were like, but she's so tan though, how is she your sister? And then Katie said, she just is. So ever since Joseph opened his family's door to me, I learned one thing. That we could be family with people that have nothing to do with how you look. That you could create that deep connection with someone as long as you open yourself up to one another. Halfway through my program, Joseph was graduating and he decided to join the US Army. Around the same time, I won an essay contest held by my peace mission program and I got the chance to attend a week-long leadership training in Washington, DC. While I was in DC, I found out that actually my program, the, my peace mission program, was funded by Congress as a response to 9-11. That same week too, I got to attend a, an open foreign affairs budgeting meeting with Secretary Hillary Clinton, and they were discussing the war on terrorism in the Middle East. I suddenly, I sat there in that room and I felt very conflicted. I was sitting there as a direct result of Congress funding my program that was a response to an event that took on so many lives. And I was also sitting there that time as a sister with my brother about to enter the army and may well serve in a war zone in the future. And I asked myself, is this what it means to discover our common humanity? What I mean by our common humanity is the fact that we're all humans, and we're all connected. And because we're all humans, that must mean that we're bound to be able to feel the same sense of contentment, the same need of safety, and that we all, we all want to belong at some point to someone. We're all connected because one event that has nothing to do with you could impact you, whether you realize it or not, or whether you realize it now or much later. And that I was sitting there both as a Muslim girl that often has to defend her own faith because of what had happened, but that same event now made me feel concerned because my brother is about to enter the army and may well serve in a war zone because of that same event. Because of that too, I realized that our common humanity also has challenges. Although we're able to feel some sense of contentment, safety, and also sense of belonging, but the way we choose to achieve those senses could be different. And although we're all impacted, we could be impacted by, by this one event, the way we choose to react to this event could also be different. Joseph and I would often be in a car and we would debate about world affairs. We would fall in a completely different, op different opposite views. I would argue that we don't need any of this war. We don't need any of this violence. And he would argue that, no, sometimes we need to bear arms in order to do what's right and to protect others. 
and we would debate and debate like there's no tomorrow, but at the end of the day, we'll make that turn in the corner of the street and realize that actually, we were both in that car to get some ice cream. And so we'll end the debate and be like, get off and just get my, our ice cream and just go home happily. That made me think as well, that as our common humanity, we're able to find that common ground. At the end of the day, our humanity continues to exist because we can get out of our own self and start thinking about the bigger picture. If it's true that one event like 9-11 could, could impact us all, it must be also true that the small act that you do every day can create the ripple of changes within our common humanity. At the end of the day, I am a living proof of that act of kindness. The act of Congress sponsoring this program has changed my life. The small act of kindness that Joseph did by telling his parents about me and opening up their doors for me also changed my life. And because of that, I want to do that small little change of kindness too. With this spirit, I started joining a lot of social impacts projects. I helped build a library in a rural village in my country. I also built music programs for the homeless shelters in New York City. Lately, I've been working a lot on survivors of human trafficking empowerment program in Jakarta. It's called Buku Kami, where we train survivors of human trafficking to learn to get back on their feet again. Because of this project too, in New York City, I was able to work with a similar organization empowering human trafficking survivors. Working on social impact, social issues, made me think that, you know what? A problem in one city is not an isolation from the world. Human trafficking happening in Jakarta is not an isolation to what's actually happening in a global scale. But at the same time, learning about one issue can help you learn about what's going on in the different parts of the world. With the spirit of opening myself up, I also joined NYU Abu Dhabi, a school where my peers come from 100 countries or more. I did a study away program again in Belgium, where I got to live with the Kunhats family. The Kunhats family opened their door for me to learn French and to also to learn about European Union. When I shared with them that I joined a lot of social impacts project, they showed me films about social empowerment, took me to organizations that do empowerment. They invested in my project and they were actually more excited than I was. Being with the Kunhats family made me learn that actually as well, it doesn't matter where you are. It doesn't matter who you are. The act of kindness of them showing me about all of this information, giving me feedback on my brainstorming session, helped me better understand my idea, and then I carry their impacts forward in my projects. And I wouldn't be able to feel all of this had my parents never let me go. And I would never be able to feel all of this if it's just the fear that I'm following, if it's the fear of my neighbors, for example. Fear and ignorance are the prisons within our own understanding. They prevent us from seeing us as our common humanity in a bigger picture. And to fight this is to get out of our own comfort zone. To be another Joseph Malachek who just asked that one more question. To be my parents or more parents in the world to encourage young girls to discover the world. And to ask us a question every day on how to let others live beyond our own judgment. As I was preparing for this talk, I actually video called Joseph, and I told him, hey bro, so I practiced my talk and my friends were wondering, how is it like to have a Muslim sister? And he made a strange face and he said, that question is wrong. And I'm like, how is that wrong? And he said, why does it matter to have any label before the word sister? The question should be, how is it like to have a sister? And your brothers at home would know. Actually, any brother in the world would know. How is it like to have a sister? It really sucks. <laughs> <laughs> and 
and you still owe me a lot of ice creams, but you're still my sis, so we support each other. This day last year, I got an assignment in my principles of marketing class to attend Ground Zero, to go to Ground Zero to see the location. Eight-year-old Dia would never thought that she would actually stand there that day where it all began. And as I was touching the names on the dark marble stone, I suddenly had a fa flashback of the footage of the tanks and the children I saw 15 years ago. But something within me has changed. You know, 15 years ago when I was eight, I made a prayer for the children. That day in Ground Zero, I realized I needed to pray for so much more. I pray for the children, but also the soldiers. I pray for the families who lost their loved ones, but also the Muslim community who has had to carry the stereotypes. I pray for the re aftermath of that, the war and the refugees with no homes. And I walk home that day looking up the stars and I wrote a song called A Letter to the Stars. This song is a reflection of a daughter realizing that our common humanity is beautiful, but it has a lot of work to do. This is a story over 